Well, thank you all for coming to the uh, CSE Distinguished Lecture and the uh, keynote address for the Data Mining Workshop. Our speaker today, Professor Michael Jordan. I first met him in 1991 when he was a professor of brain and cognitive science at MIT after having done a PhD in cognitive science at UCSD. He's now the Pihong Chen Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and of Statistics at UC Berkeley. It's been quite an amazing journey from psychology and cognitive science to hardcore statistics and mathematics and, and probability and computation. And in fact, if you've been part of the machine learning and statistic, statistics community uh, for any length of time, you have witnessed this, uh, this journey because the evolution of Michael's ideas and contributions and the broad themes of his work as they've evolved have in fact been the arc, have determined the arc of the statistical machine learning community. I think it's fair to say that the statistical machine learning community has gone where, where Michael has led it. Um, and in fact, this has been widely recognized by the science and engineering and the academic community. So Michael's now a, has been a member of the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of uh, Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the AAAI, ACM, IEEE, and a host of alphabet soup of acronyms that I don't know uh, or that I can't remember. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is, the, but in addition to all the great work that, that he's been doing, I want to highlight one aspect of Michael that has personally uh, impacted me very positively, uh, which is the great mentorship he's had over the years of a large number of graduate students and postdocs. Um, in fact, my first memory of Michael is I had just given this talk as a third year or second year graduate student in front of 500 people at a large machine learning conference. And um, I encountered Michael walking down from the podium and he said, you know, great job or great talk or something to that effect. And I remember being on a high for four days or five days after that. <laughs> um, and, you know, so Michael's um, graduated about, I think, 50 to 60 graduate students and postdocs over the last two decades. And, um, uh, we've all ended up in really great places, and uh, uh, so many thanks to Michael on that. And uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Michael, Professor Michael Jordan. Uh, thanks very much for the nice introduction, really lovely. Um, I'm proud of many of my past students and postdocs, and particularly of Satinder, who's done really great work over many years. He's one of the people whose papers I continue to read which to me is kind of the highest compliment of academic, one academic to another. Um, all right, so I'm pleased to be here. I assume it's a pretty heterogeneous audience, so I'll do my best to bring up some themes that uh, many of you may be interested in. Um, some of it will be inscrutable to some of you, uh, but that's okay. Hopefully I'll just spend a little bit of time on that. The title is kind of meaningless. Uh, I was, the first few words are just, just trying to give an umbrella of kind of the things I'm interested in, really bringing statistics and computation together. And um, then I did promise to say something about the bootstrap, which I will do in about matrix completion. Uh, but I saw in my abstract out there, I didn't promise to talk about Stein's method. I promised to talk about phylogenetic analysis uh, instead. So I will do that. So there is a, another line of work that I'm really excited about, Stein's method. If you know what that is and are interested, uh, go see my website. Um, OK, so let's get going. Uh, so I live close to Silicon Valley and uh, work in statistics. and. Um, often have gotten all excited about some new methodology and have gone down and given talks in the South Bay and uh, you know, say Google or whatever and they'll say, oh, great, you have this new methodology, but I have a petabyte of data. Um, will your methodology run on my data? And I him and ha basically say, you know, no. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, then I say something like, well, if you were to subsample your data, throw away most of your data, <laughs> and then I can run on the remaining part of the data and probably do well. I say, well, all the guarantees, though, I could give before are gone now. And so they'd say, well, that doesn't sound like a very impressive field you're in. And uh, then they say things like, uh, um, I also need to have a time constraint. You know, I need a fast answer. Can you, uh, uh, you know, and I have a lot of data, and, but you like data, right? Uh, can you give me a guarantee you'll give me a good answer? And I'll say, no, I can't do that at all. That's really beyond what we can promise. So, you know, then they say, well, you know, what field are you in? This is really not, doesn't sound like a reasonable engineering field. So anyway, that kind of conversation has happened several times, and uh, it, you know, after enough of those conversations, you get pretty unhappy and data dissatisfied, and I want to work on it. Okay, so there are a lot of pretty deep intellectual issues here, 
uh, really statistical uh, and computational together. So let me just sort of say a little bit about this. First of all, let's be clear on the fact that just because we're in the asymptotic regime doesn't mean we're, there are no more problems left. So you, in classical statistical education, you were told that as the number of data points gets large, everything gets simple, the error bars go to nothing, and you know, there's no real statistical issues left. It's just computation at that point. And that's definitely not the truth, the, the case. So let's be clear on the, a couple of reasons. The first is really just statistical. If you're a statistician, this is meat and potatoes. For the rest of you, it may not be a little more subtle. Um, so I got, think of my data as rows and columns. Rows like a database person. Rows are my entities and columns are my features or covariates or descriptors or attributes. If I have a thousand rows, uh, you know, I usually don't collect too many columns. I'm not that, you know, if I have a thousand, if the rows are people, I may be interested in height, weight, income, you know, a few things that describe the things I'm interested in and the consequences I'd like to pull out of the database or the queries I'm interested in answering. Um, if I have three billion rows, so I've collected data on most of the people in the world, I'm going to be interested in a lot more descriptors. I'm going to be interested in what kind of books do you like to read, what, what meal you had yesterday, what city you live in, um, what's your genome. You know, all kinds of descriptors, so that I can make predictions about you at a very fine level of granularity. Like, will you click on my ad, or will you buy life insurance, or, or, or can I provide some service that you actually are really interested in? I'm not just show you an ad. And that's where the, the world is going. Um, but really, there's a real, there's a gotcha here, there's a real problem, which is that, um, you know, if the number of rows is growing up to three billion, the number of columns is probably growing linear in that. I, you know, I probably need a linear number of descriptors. All right, but I'm, I'm interested in my hypothesis space is, the, uh, is the, all the combinations of all the columns. I'm interested, you live in Beijing, and your last book you read was Jonathan Franzen, and you, you know, like punk rock music, what's the probability you want life insurance or whatever? And, you know, I can make up facetious ones, but a lot of them are really interesting. Like, you know, you have this mark in your genome, and you smoke, and so on, what's the probability you're going to have a bad disease, um, and so on. So, uh, you know. You're interested in an exponential number of hypotheses. So as I get more and more data, I'm not in the I'm not I'm complete opposite of the asymptotic regime. I'm always in a regime where I have way too little data for the, the, the ambitions I have for the data. All right. So if you start looking for data, looking for patterns in this exponential space, you're going to find all kinds of patterns that look perfectly, perfectly true on the data, which are just totally bogus. Just by chance alone they occurred. Okay? That's a theorem. <laughs> and it's what happens in real life. So you start working with companies that have this kind of data that's just start rolling out simple methodology. They get all kinds of things which are just total white noise and false positives just swamp them and they turn off the machine. So that's actually what really happens. It's not they have computational problems and they can't scale to the large data. It's that they get false positives and it kills them. All right. The second part of the problem is more of the classical computer science one, which is that you know a, a, an inference algorithm runs in some amount of time, n cubed, p cubed, n log n, whatever. And if I have uh, um, you know, 10,000 data points and I have an hour and I want to make the decision, that's probably pretty good. If I've got now a billion data points and I still want to make a decision in an hour, then that algorithm is not going to run in an hour. All right? So then I have to run an approximation of the algorithm maybe, but now my inferential guarantees are less good. Or I have to subsample, but now again my inferential guarantees maybe are, are gone because I took way too much data. So I, you gave me more data and I may have given you back an answer which is worse. All right, and that seems paradoxical. That doesn't feel right to me as an engineering science. My resource, you know, classical computer science is the game of what are, how, what are my resources and how do I apply them to algorithms so I get increased performance as a function of my resources, time and space and energy and so on. So I'm giving you a resource now, which is data, and I'm giving you more and more of your resource, and your performance is getting worse and it gets better for a while, and then it gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, that's where, that is the state we're in. And so I think that's just totally wrong. We're just totally immature in this field. All right, so here's one way to state a goal. Um, I don't think we can solve this, but given an inferential goal and a fixed computational budget, say an hour, provide a guarantee that the quality of inference will increase monotonically as data accrue without bound. So kind of the, both the statistician's perspective of talking about risks and, and guarantees and the uh, computer science uh, st statement of uh, scalability, and moreover, I want to do this without bound. I don't want to have to face this problem again every 10 years. I want to think principles that allow me to scale statistical inference. So we're far from there. Okay, so I, I can't solve that problem. I'm kind of working and thinking about that to some degree uh, without much, too much success. Um, there are aspects of the problem you can you know, formalize and make progress on, but the overall problem I think is still really unposed and unsolved. So what I'm going to talk about today is a different kind of more bottom-up way of thinking. Let's take a few, let's take a particular computational principle, a particular divide and conquer. Um, you know, great pr principle, lots of algorithms are divide and conquer algorithms, and bring it more fully into contact with statistical inference. 
Uh, and I kind of like doing this and for, for kind of one reason is that statistical inference is somehow about aggregating things. When you pull things together, laws of large numbers and central limiters start to, to come into play and you can make inferences. You can talk about, you can quantify things and, and error bars go, get smaller. And somehow divide and conquer is the opposite of it. It's trying to pull things apart and so it fights statistical inference in some way. But, but I believe you have to do divide and conquer to scale or something like that, so we need to face this issue. All right, so here's the first little piece. There's gonna be three little pieces here. Um, and this is perhaps the, the, the most significant one for the computer science audience. So I'm gonna tell you a little about the bootstrap and why it can't be used at big, on big data and why there's another procedure, which I'll describe, which can be used on big data and can give you bootstrap interval, uh, confidence intervals on big data. How many of you know what the bootstrap is already? All right, so that's more, that's about a third. It's pretty good. Um, so uh, if, if you don't know, it's time to learn. It's a really great idea. And, I, and it's, if you're a statistician, you know what it is, and a lot of stat non statisticians don't know what it is, and I think that's a big uh, problem. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, the problem, uh, the, the bootstrap, is not just about making predictions and inferences and running an algorithm and get down a number. It's about putting a confidence interval around it, assessing the quality of the inference, how good an inference it is. So if you ran some algorithm and it gave the number 10.5 out, and I'm gonna make a life determining decision if it's bigger than 10 or not, I'd really like to know what the error bar is before I really feel confident, you know, comfortable about making that decision. So it's a huge error bar, I'm not so comfortable, but it's a tiny one, I'm comfortable. So I gotta get error bars on things, everything, not just occasionally, I gotta get them on every inference I ever make. So the idea is you observe data, you calculate some estimate, let's call it a parameter estimate, but it can be a prediction of any kind, uh, it, can, it can be a function, it doesn't have to be a parametric quantity, but let's call it a parameter estimate for now. It's a functional on the data. And I'm not interested in the parameter so much as I'm interested in the quality of the estimate, so let's say a confidence region, okay? Okay, so the goal here is gonna be to get a procedure that estimates estimator quality. You know, we wanna talk about how good an estimator is after you've seen data. And we want it to be uh, accurate, meaning that, and this is the classical statistician's goal, which is that I told you that this confidence interval covers the truth 95% of the time. Well, if I do it nine, a bunch and bunch of times, 95% of the time it actually covered the truth. That's what it means to be accurate. And that's hard to achieve. That's what the field statistics has done um, you know, pretty successfully. We want it to be automatic, meaning that after, for every brand new problem, rethink the problem and build new principles and all that. I wanted this thing just to work. And again, statisticians have done that. Lots and lots of situations are some procedures that work uh, out of the box. What they haven't faced is the scalability issue, so that's what we want to talk about today. Okay, so here's how a frequentist thinks about the world. There's kind of two branches of statistics, and the frequentist is more about analyzing procedures uh, versus the Bayesian. And here's how a frequentist thinks about analyzing procedures. So ideally, uh, as a statistician, you would have not just one data set, you would have multiple data sets. And you would get your estimate or your prediction on each data set, and then you look at the spread of those predictions, and that would give you an estimate of the error bar, the, the, you know, the fluctuations in your estimator. And if there's not much fluctuation, you're pretty confident in the individual estimate. All right? um, so that's what a frequency would love to do, is have multiple data sets. All right? But you don't have multiple data sets, you only have one data set, so it seems like you can't really think of frequentism as an actual implementable principle. But you can, and that's the idea of the bootstrap. So here's the idea, which is that the data came from somewhere, I have a sample of some, that, that thing, and the underlying generating mechanism, it's a distribution of some kind, and so let's draw it here as a continuous distribution, and let's call that the population. So data arise out of the population. We don't get to see the population, but the supreme being gets to see the population. The supreme being then generated data out of that population by sampling from that, and that gave, gave us some data. So the Supreme Dean did that. Now, ideally then, we would do the Supreme Dean or uh, would do this multiple times. The first time, the second time, and the nth time. So we'd get M data sets out of this underlying population. And then you would get your estimator, M times, and then you put that into something like a confidence interval calculation after you've got all these M values. You can just calculate a confidence interval. All right, so we can't do that, but instead what we did is we got a sample out of the population. And then you think of the sample not as a list of numbers, think of it as a histogram. Okay, so a histogram itself is a distribution. It's called the empirical distribution, all right? And in a well-quantifiable sense, it's an approximation to the true underlying distribution. In a uniform sense, in various senses, it's an approximation to the underlying object, all right? So here's the kind of beautiful idea, which is that you forget that there ever was a population. You take that histogram and you pretend that that's the population. You live in a world where that's the population. You're the supreme being in that world. So in that world, you can generate multiple data sets. 
because you have a population that histogram. All right, so you generate a data set from that histogram. What does that mean? Well, you take that, the original data and you sample them again. If there was n data points, you sample them with replacement n times. You get out a new data set in which some of the original data points were copied several times and some of them didn't occur at all. That's what happens when you sample with replacement. On average, 0.632 of the original data points occurred. Okay, and the rest of them didn't occur. All right, so that's a data set that came from that population. All right, and then you can now apply the estimator to that and get a number. But now you can do that again. You can resample from the, this guy again. And then you get another resampled data set. You apply the estimator, you'll probably get a different value. And now you do that a whole bunch of times. And um, how many times should you do that to get good estimates of, of error? About 200 is kind of the usual rule of thumb for point estimates. For other kind of problems, it could be a little bit more. Now, the be beauty of this is that it's, it's totally generalizable. You can do this for the mean, the median, the support vector machine, the whatever, you know, decision tree. Um, you just resample the replacement 200 times on each training set. You apply your estimator, whatever it is, and you get a spread. Um, moreover, it's totally paralyzable. You do those 200 things in parallel. You send the, you know, one resample to one processor, another, another processor. You send it to your 200 processors. They all in parallel compute their estimators, and then you send them back to get the confidence interval. So when I was start a couple of years ago thinking about cloud computing and what it means for our world and uh, how we do inference at scale and so on, this just you know, obviously jumped up in front of my eyes. Well, cloud computing is the perfect match to the bootstrap. So let's think about how we can think about using the bootstrap generically across you know, all kinds of database applications just part of the, as part of the database. And I still believe that's kind of true to a certain, but there's a, there's a gotcha. So let me just first of all summarize. This is work due to, it's a very famous piece of work due to Efron. And this is just a picture of what I've already said. So you take the original data and, re, and that replaces the population. You think of it as a histogram and you generate multiple resamplings. The star means a resampling. It's a bootstrap sample. And you get your multiple values, your estimator, and you plug them in. So that's just what I said before in a flow diagram. As I said, you get 0.632 of the original data set. Okay, so if I have 1,000 data points, uh, each subsample is um, 600, that's no big deal. What if I have a terabyte of data and I want to get error bars on quantities in a terabyte of data? That's what we need to do these days. Well, each subsample is 632 gigabytes. And yeah, I can do those in parallel, but I've got to send 632 gigabytes out to each of my 200 processors. And that's just no, that's no good. That's going to ruin my network. All right, so if we can't do that, and it's not going to scale to a petabyte and so on, just no hope. All right, uh, so that seems like a real problem. We have this beautiful procedure, and it's not, not many such procedures that are automatic and, and, uh, you know, and uh, accurate like the bootstrap. We can't do it on big data. All right, so that, that, that makes you kind of unhappy. There's another idea that came out a little bit after the bootstrap, which is called subsampling, which seems on the surface of, to solve the problem which is the following. You take that original data set and you take a small subsample of it. And B is maybe like square root of N, so it's a you know, big reduction. And now you apply your estimator to that subsample. Okay? And now um, that's just one subsample. You could get another subsample. And you could do that again and again and again, say 200 times. You could apply your estimator to each one of those and now you get some notion of spread. The problem is that that's on the wrong scale. Okay? The error bars you want are on data of size n, you're getting error bars on data of size b, and the scale is wrong. And you don't know, in general, how to correct. If the estimator is a square root of n estimator, you would correct by you know, multiplying by square root of n over b. But it's not necessarily a square root of n estimator, and you don't know that a priori. So it becomes a lot less automatic. You would have to do some analysis to figure out how to do that, rescaling. That's one problem. Another problem is that um, it's hard to actually choose the right value of b. Uh, this thing is pretty sensitive to the choice of B, so much so that I don't think you'd want to view this as an automatic procedure. And I'll show you that examples of, of an experiment here in just a second. In fact, I think right now, yes. So here's a little, we started doing some work on this because we thought this might be the way to go. Uh, so here's a little experiment with a uh, 100-dimensional uh, covariate space, uh, 50,000 data points. Uh, we sampled, we wanted the ground truth so we could actually calibrate the error bars. Are they, they correct? So we sample from a student t distribution, we do least squares, estimate a parameter vector, and then uh, calculate confidence intervals and evaluate them. And here's the main point of this slide, which is that b is chosen to be n to some power, uh, say, one half up to one, somewhere in that range. We're subsampling at some rate, and gamma quantifies that. Here's the results when you do this experiment. 
uh, as a function of the processing time that you're running this algorithm that's subsampling and comp computing error bars, ho hopefully the, error, the bars will start to come down. They won't go to zero because you have a finite amount of data. Uh, and so here's what happens with the bootstrap. This is relative error. You want, you want it to be small. Bootstrap kind of comes down and starts to stabilize. Subsampling when uh, the uh, gamma is 0.5 is way up there. It's just not converging. It's terrible. So square root of it was too aggressive. If you bring it down to 0.6, you start to do better, but still not, not good. That's a big difference in the bootstrap. Below that, it actually beats the bootstrap. But then if you go up to 0.9, it, it's worse again. So there was a little range at which it worked, but outside of the range, it really failed. All right, and that range will change. It's different on different problems. Okay, so that, that's, no, that's a problem. That's not a, a generic solution to this problem. Okay, so we still are kind of left without a procedure that'll do bootstrap style error bars on large data. All right, so we have a new procedure that we think uh, d does solve this problem. It's called bag of little bootstraps, BLB. And I can describe it, it's pretty simple. Um, so go back to this picture here where I took there's the underlying population, sample endpoints, and then sample a subsample of that. And now, conceptually, what's happened is you actually got this thing directly from the population. It went through an intermediate stage, but this is a random sample from the population also. Okay? It happens to be a little smaller, but it's still a random sample from the population. And it's also, therefore, an approximation of the population. And my drawing doesn't make it look like a very good approximation, but think where B is, you know, a million, it's not going to be too bad. Okay? And now, it's a histogram. Forget that it was composed of B points. It's a distribution. All right, and it's approximation of the truth. So apply this exact same bootstrap principle as before and sample from that thing with replacement. But uh, you use the bootstrap on that subsample. Right? But now when you subsample, you don't subsample, or we say you resample, so you don't do it B times. That would give you error bars on the wrong scale. That's what we, that was the problem with the previous procedure. You resample the replacement N times because that's what the bootstrap should be doing. If you're trying to get error bars on the scale of n, you've got a distribution. You sample from it n times. And what does it mean to sample a histogram which has support on b points n times? Well, it just means you resample the replacement. A lot of those points will occur many, many times. And some of them won't occur at all, but most of them will occur a lot of times. So you record those b points plus the count. And that's one of your 200 data sets. Okay, so I'm bootstrapping a uh, uh, distribution that has support of size B, uh, but resampling n times. I'm doing the correct bootstrap at the right scale. I have to rescale in this procedure. Okay, so if I do that on one particular subsample, I'm actually getting correct bootstrap error bars. It's actually the correct scale. No, no rescaling needed, just automatic. It's going to be noisy, though, because it's a small subsample. But why not do it now 200 times? Bootstrap 200 different subsamples. Every one of them is correct. So you might imagine that if you average their results, that would be the bagging part of the procedure then, you'll still get an estimator which is correct. And that turns out to be true. Okay, so that's the, uh, these next couple slides just fill that out. You pretend the subsample is the population, you resample from it with replacement, and critically, the di big difference is you resample n times, not b. Um, okay, so there's the summary of it. I think that I'll skip that slide, just show you the picture. It's a two nested loop, kind of, or two nested stages. Take the original data, you subsample them, and you get a number of subsamples. On each subsample, think of it as a processor now, you take that subsample and you run the bootstrap as before. All right? And that'll give you finally an estimator um, of the accuracy, of the quality estimator for each subsample, and then you average the quality estimators to get the overall quality. All right. So that's the new idea. And I don't know if I acknowledge my collaborators or colleagues on this. Ariel Kleiner, the first author, student work with me at Berkeley. Um, uh, Perna Sarkar and Amit Talwalkar are all working with me at Berkeley on this project. Um, let me show you that this works. It's the same uh, experiment as before. There's the bootstrap, same curve as before, and this is the new procedure for all the different values of gamma. So you see it really is beating the bootstrap, actually, for all values of gamma. So um, we think this is much more uh, automatic kind of procedure. So this was on sort of 50,000 data points, modest scale problem. This has since been done in a real distributed architecture. Um, uh, on, um, on a half a terabyte of data. So this can really, this can scale. All right, so there's some theorems here. I'm going to skip them in the interest of time, but we have a paper on all this if you're interested in bootstrap. One of the beautiful things about the bootstrap if you're a theoretician is that it actually beats the central limit theorem. It has, it has convergence rate, which goes not as 1 over square root of n, but 1 over n. It's faster than the central limit theorem. It's one of the, another amazing 
one of the reasons the bootstrap is so popular, or so important part of statistics. And this procedure also happens to retain the higher correctness of the bootstrap. We have a consistency result, and I'm going to kind of just skip these slides, but here are some slides which give you a, a bit of the outline of the, and there's a final statement of the 1 over n accuracy of the new procedure. Okay, that was the first part of the talk. Um, I'm going to move on now. That was, again, kind of divide and conquer, what do we parallelism, and not just to take a machine learning algorithm and make it parallel. I think that's interesting, too. But this was to how do you evaluate procedures and do that in parallel. I think that's even more interesting in some ways because that's where we have all these multiple hypotheses and we're trying multiple models and we're trying to get their individual notions of errors so we can calibrate and um, make decisions. Okay, so um, that was one talk. Now, it turns out I, these slides are on separate p files because this work is also new. It hasn't yet been... Uh, Put in one file. Okay, no, that's the third part of the talk, the phylogeny part. There was another thing right here. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So uh, let me now find a full screen mode. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to only tell you about the first part of this on matrix completion, and I, that, that would have been a, that's about the stuff on Stein's method. There are a list of collaborators here, several of who were collaborating on the Stein's method part. The collaborators on the part I'll tell you about are Lester Mackey and Amit Tallwalker. And this is a very, very simple idea, and I'm just going to kind of mention it briefly because it's a divide and conquer idea, and it's really simple and, and valuable in practice, and I, I just think it's you know, kind of worth chatting about it a little bit. So this is an approach to matrix completion that we call divide, factor, combine. Um, so the matrix completion problem, very popular in recent years, it's that you take a matrix in which uh, many of the entries are unobserved, and you want to fill them in. So the Netflix prize is an example of this, where this would be the users, and there's the movies. These are ratings and people have rated only a small subset of the, uh, the movies, and you'd like to fill in their, predict their ratings on movies they haven't seen yet. And there are many other examples of this problem. Um, there are really nice algorithms that have some very strong guarantees uh, that if the matrix has certain properties, I'll, which I'll briefly mention here in a second, then you can recover with high probability the exact matrix. Um, the problem for this talk is that they all relate, rely on singular value decompositions in a particular a truncated SVD which doesn't scale to the really big problems that we're interested in. It's, it's, it's a cubic algorithm, it just doesn't scale. So we gotta, we gotta deal with that. So we're gonna do a very simple divide and conquer, really just take the matrix and break it into pieces kind of algorithm, and then we're gonna prove something about that, that it, it, it also, um, you know, provably correct algorithm under, under the same conditions as before. Okay, so I'm gonna skip really quick through some slides here because I wanna get to the third part, and there's a kind of lot of notation that I don't want you to absorb. I just wanna give a high level eye picture here tell you a little about the theorem, and there's again a paper on this if you want to dig into some details. Um, so the basic story is that you have to make some assumptions about the matrix. Uh, you've got, you know, n times m degrees of freedom, and you have a very small subset of the observed entries, so it, without assumptions you can't fill in the matrix. So what do you assume? And then one of the more popular assumptions that does turn to work in practice is it has low rank, very low rank. Um, so you assume that it can be factorized as a thin column matrix times a thin row matrix. Now, yeah, that's not enough. You just have low rank. You have to have some more, more properties. For, particularly, you can't just have like whole columns missing. You wouldn't be able to fill in the column. So you have to kind of assume some form of a um, uniform at random or some other uh, sampling model. This is a particularly common one. Um, it's not the only one. And um, another thing you have to assume is somehow the information is spread out uh, about uh, the structure, the, the, the rank. So you can't have, you don't want to have matrices like that, where if you just didn't sample the one, you would learn nothing about the matrix. It would look like all zeros. So you, you don't allow that kind of thing happening by having some kind of a coherence assumption. This is just one of the ways that it's been formalized to be, have a matrix be well, incoherent with the standard basis. It's a spread of information. Um, you guarantee you, you have spread. Uh, and if you make those kind of assumptions, then you solve a, the following optimization problem. You'd like to solve the one at the top there, minimize the rank, subject to a uh, match the, match the entries that are observed kind of constraint. You can't, that's a NP hard problem. You relax it to a minimize the trace norm or nuclear norm, again subject to the same constraints, and that's a convex problem that you can solve in polynomial time, but unfortunately a high degree polynomial time. Anyway, there's a theorem that says if you solve this problem, then with high probability you get the, you know, you get the actual matrix you, as if you had solved the original problem up there. So here's an example of such a theorem. It uh, says if the matrix has some properties, if you sample at a certain rate, which is n log, log squared n, very nice, not n m, um, then you actually get an answer which has uh, quality, you know, was close with high probability the true answer. 
Okay, now, the, again, the problem here is this is going to have to, it runs a truncated support, uh, single divide decomposition so it doesn't scale. So what can you do? So we're going to do a very simple divide and conquer algorithm here. We're just going to take a big matrix, I think in the next page I show you, yes, here I just want to show you the algorithm. Take a big matrix and you divide it C1, C2, uh, you know, in these pieces. All right, and each one of those is now a, a thinner column matrix. And then you take the, the existing matrix completion algorithms on each column matrix independently. So you do this in parallel. And you do matrix completion on the column matrix. And that gives me C1 hat, C2 hat, blah, blah, blah. All right? And now I need to aggregate all that information. And how do I aggregate that information? Well, I project that onto one of the column spaces of the, so in this case, C1. So I take all the matrices and I project that onto the column matrix, column space of C1, and that aggregates everybody together in the same space. So it's a map reduce kind of thing. You map out, everybody gets a, uh, little small matrix to do matrix completion on, you get, you get a factorized answer, and you take the factors and then put them all back together on a particular column space. And now you can do this not just on C1, you can do that on multiple column spaces and get a kind of an ensemble method, which is what we actually do in practice to get the best results. Okay, so there's a very simple algorithm, very natural. Uh, does it work? Uh, first of all, there's a theorem that says that it works. You get basically the same kind of rates as you get for the full matrix uh, completion. Uh, sampling a vanishingly a small fraction of, the, of the, the columns of the matrix. So, nice theorem. And if, if I were to give the third part of the talk that was the more the theory part of the talk on Stein's method, it would be how do you prove theorems like that? So there's a nice general idea based on something called Stein's method that allows you to prove, talk about large deviations of random matrices that applies to problems like this and lots of others. So anyway, I'm not going to give that part of the talk. That was, again, just publicity. Um, so it does work, and let me just show you that it works in practice. So here is an example. If I reveal 2% uh, of the entries, you know, very, very, very sparse data, you know, I'm revealing very little of the actual overall matrix, the base matrix completion algorithm comes down and does really well by 2%. It start, gets eventually better and better as you reveal up to 10%, but, you know, amazingly good at only 2 Here's a bunch of versions of this new algorithm. I've told you about basically projection ensemble and... Uh, that's these blue curves here. Uh, these are some others which work less well. But at about, you know, by 4% of the data, it's performing as well as the base algorithm. At two, it's already starting to get, one, one of them is actually just as good as the base algorithm. Okay, so it really, you know, working on the kind of class of problems that we would hope it would work on. And then here's the main take home, which is that there's your base matrix completion. And this is now time. And so this is complexity. And you're seeing the cubic growth that you would expect out of that. And here's all the new algorithms. And so they're growing, you know, inevitably. They'll, they'll, this won't go forever. Uh, it'll, it'll start to hurt. But that gives you, you know, quite a significant, you know, makes a real practical algorithm. So I view this actually as the existing best method for large-scale matrix completion. We did this on the Netflix da data set. And uh, so this is actually a really good large-scale problem. The full data set. It's 100 million ratings, 17,000 um, uh, columns, and 480,000 rows. Um, and... Uh, we compared to the best single method, uh, which is an, an algorithm known as APG, which is one of these SVD-based algorithms. And it gets an answer, a, a root mean, mean squared error of 8.8433. And here's some versions of this new procedure, which do achieve the same error rate at a order of magnitude um, faster, uh, shorter amount of time. OK, so that's uh, part two of the talk. Uh, and I uh, didn't connect to part three that, that much, but just to, to summarize then briefly is that I believe this is not a pretty common paradigm. You take a fairly simple procedure, you paralyze it in a pretty naive way, and then you have to do some theory to make sure that you haven't lost something deeply along the way. And I actually think a lot of these theory will involve random matrices, and I, that's why I like Stein's method. It's a very nice method for doing that. Okay, so that, I'm going to skip that part of the talk then and now return to the third part, which is over here. Yes, okay. Um, and again, a knowledge of collaborator here. This is Alexandra Bouchard-Coté, who is up in UBC, um, a professor of statistics up there. Uh, and again, I need to find a view. Oops, I'm not in the wrong. No, here it is. Oops, that, that was a mistake. I'm not good at PowerPoint. Um, how do you, uh, yeah, I remember how you do this. You go scroll through and you do that. Uh, I think you do this thing, right? Ah, good. Okay, so third part of the talk. Wash your brain of everything I said before. There's another divide and conquer idea. 
but a different divide and conquer idea. And I like this one probably the most because this is the most subtle one. This uses probability theory, not just kind of naively splitting things up. So this splits things up in a, in a probabilistic way. And what does that mean to split things up in a probabilistic way? Well, basically that means the Poisson process. The Poisson process is even more beautiful than the Gaussian in some ways if you're a statistician or probabilist. Uh, it has all these combinatorial properties and you can do thinning of it. You can take a Poisson process, which is a bunch of random points, and you can subsample them randomly and you get a, a thing object which is itself a Poisson process. And so it just leads itself to divide and conquer thinking. So you're going to see a problem here, which I think is a pretty interesting problem involving phylogenetics, which it doesn't seem to have any divine conquer strategy. It just seems to be all tangled up and leads to dynamic programming algorithms, which are hopelessly complex. But if you think about it for a while and rearrange things, you see a Poisson process emerging, and then you can do divide and conquer, and you can solve the problem. Okay, so that's the message of this part of the talk. Okay, so, um, and the other reason I talk about it is just that phylogenetic analysis is a pretty interesting, compelling problem. Um, it has to do with finding trees like this, but also aligning data. And alignment problems come up in all kinds of fields, and uh, my field doesn't tend to address them nearly as much as we should. We assume the data are already aligned by somebody else. We have a design matrix in which the columns have a meaning, and all the data all come in all aligned and everything. And that's just rarely the case in real life. So you want to both align and do your inference. And so phylogenetics kind of requires you to think about that issue. All right, so with that as background, um, what is the phylogenetic analysis problem? Uh, you know, I've got, in this case, just four species, and I want to find a tree, and I want to find links of the branches that reflects the evolutionary distance among the, the species. Okay? Um, and so this is often modeled as there's a random tree, uncertain tree that I'd like to infer, and the, the branch links are parameters of something like a continuous time Markov chain that represents the evolutionary path of some procedure as things mutate and, and, and uh, insertions and deletions occur. All right, so now uh, this problem's really hard and uh, most, <coughs> most of the literature on it has made some real simplifications. And here's, the, here's one, one uh, common simplification. Um, let's suppose that for every one of my species I only had one character, i.e., um, you know, like if it, the DNA, I only took one, one letter, one site in the genome, right? Not a very good model. But this is what you did with dinosaurs. You maybe measured a small handful. They were called characters, right? The, maybe the size of the cranium and the size of the foot or something, like two or three things. And that was enough. Okay? Nowadays, we have genomic data. We don't think this way anymore, but this is kind of the heritage of this field was to think about a small number of characters. So let's think about the case we have just one character per species, like ACGT. All right? Uh, well, then I have a so-called graphical model. I have a, 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 a probabilistic model here in which the existing species are the leaves of this tree. Those nodes represent multinomial nodes. They could be in one of, say, for DNA, in one of four states, A, C, G, or T, all right? And there's an ancestral uh, organism that was in some state. It's not shaded, meaning it's unknown, all right? And then it, there was a mutation that occurred, and now two new species arose, and they, at some moment in time, had a, uh, a, a C, G, or T. And so some mutations occurred along the path there. And they're still unshaded because they were not observed either. Then there was another, there were two more splittings, um, speciation events that led to A, C, G, and T that in four existing species, which we did observe. Okay. So we'd like to infer the tree, uh, where were the splittings, and also here I have branch links. Here they're buried in the formalism, which there's a transition probability there that's just parameterized by a branch link that's just buried in the actual formula you use for the edge, edge probability, whereas in the phylogenetic literature you draw it out. All right, if you did that, then that's, this, this is kind of what you learn about in Graphical Models 101. You learn how to do the EM algorithm on this and estimate the parameters and estimate the tree, and you know, it's kind of an easy, easy problem. It's a tree. All right, now, you don't have just one character. You have string value characters. All right, so, well, how can you treat string value characters? Well, if all the strings were the same length and they already came in pre-aligned, and if you assumed that every, well, let's do it this way, they came in aligned, like every column of the alignment was independent of every other column, if you made both those assumptions, then it's just in independent graphical models. And you usually put a box around that, or a K. K independent graphical models, you put a box around that to talk about uh, replicates of a basic graphical model. And now the probability structure of this is the product over the individual probabilities. And you take the logarithm, it becomes the sum, and EM algorithm, and everything goes through like before. No, no, nothing new happens there. Then this is what's really done in the literature. This is if you pick up a book on phylogenetics, you learn all, everything I just said. You learn, you know, it takes a few hundred pages to describe it all, but that's what you learn how to do, is write down the likelihood for that model, run the EM algorithm, and estimate parameters and tree. Okay, 
Anyway, I hope you agree that this is a way too, too simple. The real problem is that we, we need to do multiple sequence alignment. We have these strings coming in. They don't have the same length. And moreover, they're not aligned a priori. We've got to find how they align uh, as part of the problem. Okay, so there's two representations of alignment. I, I, these, this is kind of nicer in some ways, and that's the one you often will see. Okay, so we want to find what are called homologous nucleotides, which were uh, actually uh, had an ancestral nucleotide they both arose from. So the holy grail of the field has now been for some, quite some time, about three decades, find the tree and find the alignment jointly. And so kind of one data structure to think about that in is it's a kind of a tree where I have these paths and those paths are the homologous ed edges. And so I need to find all those paths. You do the alignment together with finding the tree. OK, so there has been nice work on this problem. Uh, pretty sophisticated people have worked on this problem. And there's a beautiful paper by Thorne et al. in 1991. It's really got this started as a formal subject. And so they had a little continuous time Markov chain along paths in a tree. So here's just to take one edge of a tree. I have ATC at the top. And I want to evolve that forward in time allowing for insertions and deletions so I can get alignment issues. If I had no insertions and deletions, I wouldn't have alignment issues. So I need to allow that. So they have a little model that gives you insertions and deletions. So how does it work? Well, it's just a little Markov chain, continuous time Markov chain. So you have these alarm clocks at every site, um, and they're running independently and, uh, for some exponential amount of time. And the first one that rings determines what kind of event you have. And then you make that event occur. So you have, either have an insertion where you put a new nucleotide between the existing ones, or a mutation or substitution. You just change the nucleotide to something else, or you delete a nucleotide. So in this case, the insertion clock was the first one. So you insert something to the left of the A. And what do you insert there? Well, you sample from some distribution, usually the stationary distribution and say we got a C, and so now the new string is CATC. And so you evolve forward in time, and you get a string-valued Markov chain. Okay, pretty simple, nice string-valued Markov chain. All right. Now, um, that's one path, that's one branch of the tree. And you'd think you could put that together on all the branches and take the product over the whole thing, and it's just a tree. It should be easy and nice and tractable. But if you thought, that's wrong. <laughs> and the reason is it's all this homology. So I've kind of figured out, as I locked, walked on that branch of the tree, uh, there's homologous who linked to who, all right? And now, as I go down some other branch, I've got to remember all that homology structure in making homology links for this part of the tree as well. And in general, I have to remember everything about this part of the tree to, to, to set up the homology for the new branch of the tree. So the state you need for any given branch is the rest of the tree. And in fact, you can write this out formally. You can, make a whole, you can turn this whole thing into a hidden Markov model, where the state is exponential in the size of the tree. It's all the stuff you have to remember to make homology decisions along any given branch of the tree. So it all couples into a nasty, tangled mess. All right. And this has been realized. Uh, and, and, and there was a paper just in 2005 that really made this formal. It gave a lower bound kind of argument that showed that exact computation of the total probability of the tree and the alignment, they use M for alignment, is exponential in the number of observed tacks of the leaves of the tree. So that's a killer, exponential in the number of data points, really. That's just no, that's a killer. So people can run this algorithm on about 10 species. It's you know, far below what we really want to do for lots of biological problems. Okay, so why do you care about that probability? Well, when you're actually trying to figure out which tree, you have some kind of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that starts at a given tree and then looks around for other trees nearby, decides whether to jump to them or not, and moves around the space of trees. And to evaluate whether you want to jump or not, you calculate the probability of the tree alignment here, the probability of the tree alignment here, and go uphill or not, depending on the ratio of the probabilities. So you need to calculate that probability. OK, so I'm near, nearing the end here. Not much more to say. I'm going to show you one last algorithm here. Um, OK, so that's a problem. And uh, so both kind of intuitively, this is a dynamic programming procedure, a, a hidden Markov model is needed here, and it has states exponential. It just seems like a nasty problem. And so um, you know, what people have done in the intervening three decades is kind of, um, I guess that's only two decades, is uh, you know, think about approximation procedures. It's a dynamic program. Maybe I can nearly approximate it in this way or this way. Um, but you know, I, and that's not always the right way to think. Uh, this is a cartoon model of biology. Right? Real biology isn't that. Right? And I can think of some other cartoon model of biology, which has maybe a nicer property that might also be useful in the same way this model is potentially useful, but not really practicable. So uh, that's a pretty common statistician's point of view. You don't take some God-given problem you have to solve. You know, Dick Karp said you have to solve that problem, and let's find all the best approximations to it possible. 
Um, no, the problem is to understand the biology. So you make a model of the biology, and there are many models. You don't have to work with that model. So this model's been around. It's been the canonical model for a while. But you don't have to really work with it. Okay, so anyway, long story short, there is a, another model, which is kind of close to this one, but in, in a way simpler, in some ways dumber, one would, could argue, but has a divide and conquer solution. Okay, and it's based on the Poisson process. So here's this other model. You're not going to see the Poisson process yet here, but there is one. Um, so this model says there's only one insertion clock. You pull it outside, it's kind of like a global variable, and it competes against all the others. But um, when it runs, it'll run for some amount of time. If it's the first clock to go, then you're going to make an insertion uniformly at random on the current string. So you can still get insertion events anywhere on the string, and they happen at some rate, and you still can determine that rate because that's a free parameter, um, all right? But you don't get a length-dependent insertion process. So in that sense, it's a dumber model than uh, TKF. But the deletions and the substitutions occur just like before. Okay, so why would you go to this model? Well, if you go to this model, it turns out there's a Poisson process. So there's another description of that process. And now this takes, a, there's a little jump uh, here where you have to write down some mathematics and prove some things. Uh, but what you, what you can show is there's another description of that model, which is really simple, is that you take the tree and you randomly sprinkle down onto it according to a Poisson process, I uniformly at random on the topology of the tree, some insertion events. In this case, we've got three of them. Okay? So that's just a Poisson process. Can't be anything simpler than that. And then you treat each one of the insertion events independently. Okay? And what does that mean? So on this next picture, this is the main picture here. So we have three insertion events that were thrown down on this tree. So I'm re-describing in a completely different language the process I told you about. You, you, you can't see the connection. It's not an obvious connection. This is a, so think of this as a brand new model I'm describing to you. I threw down some insertion events, and I picked one of them. Let's say I picked X2. All right, so starting up at X2, I'm going to now go down the tree, and there are no more insertion events on that tree, because I'm, I'm treating them independently. There's, there's only one insertion on that tree. So what can happen on that tree if there's no more insertions? Well, I can have a substitution in which the color changes, say, from red to green. Or I can have a deletion in which the thing goes black. All right? And if I have a deletion because I have no more insertions, that thing stays black forever. Okay? So this is a death process. It's a mutation and death process on a tree. All right, so that was for X, uh, insertion event X2. And now I conceptually do the same thing for the other insertion events. So X1 is over there. I take X1 out of the tree and its subtree below it. And then I run forward in evolution to have a mutation process and a de death process, and then I similarly do that for the other, okay? Um, all right, now, it's a Poisson process, so I can do these things independently and put them back together. They don't interact with each other in any way. That's the beauty of this. They're, and now, a death process on a tree is a really simple calculation. It's just a matrix exponential. It just decays away according to the eigenvalues of a matrix exponential, all right? So long story short, this can be all glued together, and you can do the inferential computation of probability of t comma m. And so the next three slides have that argument mathematically, and I think I'm going to just put it real quickly, but I, don't, I hope you get kind of trust me that uh, there is divide and conquer here because of the Poisson process, and therefore, if you, you know, figure out what you're dividing and conquering, you can kind of get the complexity of this, and it's, it turns out to be pretty simple. And so here is the argument uh, for the more mathematically inclined, is that um, this Poisson process is a property of exchangeability, which is kind of uniform at random. And so the, the ordering of the leaves doesn't matter. If I, swap them around, I get the same probability distribution. That's called exchangeability. And so the probability of a total alignment, uh, all the columns are exchangeable. Therefore, it suffices to calculate the probability of a single column in the alignment by exchangeability. So that's one part of the argument. Um, the other part of the argument is the following, which is that um, as I'm running an algorithm to compute this probability, I'm going to do something like the following. It's a sampling algorithm. I'm going to take this current state of the tree and I have a bunch of insertions somewhere, I'm trying to decide where to put in a new insertion or not. Right? So I'm going to look at some part of the tree and decide where to put insertion there. So think about a Poisson process in, on, the, on the real line, which is where you probably learned about it on. And I suppose I'm doing inference under a Poisson process. So I might say, OK, between point 1.5 and 2.5, I, I want you to put on an insertion there. And so you're to, you have to pick out where. I've told you, between those two points. And because of the property of the Poisson process, you have to put it uniformly at random. That's just the fact about the Poisson, okay? Once I've told you where, then it's uniform in that interval. Same thing happens here. If I told you I'm looking at some branch of the tree, um, then you put it uniformly at random along that branch. Okay. So um, anyway, and then there's a third property which I already alluded to, which is that this is a death process. Therefore, the likelihood 
for a single insertion, as you go down the tree, you calculate the probability of all paths as a matrix exponential. All right, so if you put those last three slides together and calculate the total number of operations you have to do, you find that this overall algorithm is not only not exponential, it's actually linear in the number of observed taxa and the number of columns in alignment. All right, so, you know, um, bang, you know, really big difference just by making a simple modeling choice change. Um, okay, so um, we've done some experiments on this. Uh, the, the, um, these are some early experiments comparing to some existing phylogenetic inference procedure, something called PHI-ML, and an existing sequence alignment procedure, kind of a standard clustal. These are not the best things in the world, but they're pretty standard baselines. And we generated some artificial data and evaluated according to some standard metrics. And the improvements in the new procedure over the baseline algorithms were 27% on the tree side and 43% on the alignment side. So we're getting, you know, interestingly, you know, tantalizingly interesting in the improvements for both tree and alignment inference, and we're doing it jointly not solving one problem or the other. Um, I think I'm going to skip that slide. Okay. All right, so last slide, which is, uh, again, kind of returning to the statistician's point of view. Okay, you went to a dumber model, but convinced me you didn't lose the, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and here's a kind of surprising fact, which is that if you think about the stationary distribution, if you run this thing forward a lot, long period of time, it'll arrive at some stationary distribution on strings. All right, it turns out the stationary distribution of the new process is exactly the same as the TKF model. Okay, surprisingly. So somehow the TKF model is not using all of its parameters. It's having insertions and deletions occurring in some way. They're somehow balancing and canceling. So the overall probability, you don't have to have all those parameters to capture the stationary distribution. So this new thing is somehow in some ways more attuned to that stationary distribution. If you think that's a reasonable stationary distribution, which may or may not be true. Um, anyway, that's a very interesting point that kind of makes this uh, seem less crazy than you might have thought. Um, and then, moreover, it's a Poisson process. You can superimpose other probability processes on top of it and make it random in various ways. And you can go the ways that, as statisticians, we often go, to make this more interesting and elaborate. All right, so I'm, I'm looking at the time there, and I'm, I think I'm finished. And I think I'm now going to just kind of bounce back to the top level. Uh, that, that slide was written a few months ago in which there were no technical reports, and there are now technical reports on all the pieces of this on my website if you're interested. Um, Okay, so, uh, you know, big data, and this is kind of a talk about that in some ways. It's kind of principles of approaching big data problems. And you've probably read a lot about big data. There was announcements from the White House about large amounts of money being given to certain universities in California to do big data, and lots of more money available for all the rest of you. Um, and I believe it's a real problem. I think that if I, I, I spend more time now consulting than I used to, because when I go into real companies, they all have big data and they all their new business model is built on doing things with that data. And they have no idea how to do that thing that they want to do. They try simple things that it doesn't scale, they don't have off the shelf stuff, and more if they do it, they get big error rates and no one likes it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They just have huge problems. And so they say, I say, well, what do you really want me to do? I, you know, um, they say, well, tell us, give us some more students who are trained in computation and statistics. I mean, that's the first thing they want to do is hire our students who have a little training in computer science and a little training in statistics. They think those people can come in and look at the problem and solve it on its own merits, develop scalable solutions to inference problems. Um, so that's actually the main reason that drives me towards working on this. I believe this is where the world is heading, and I believe that we need to do a good job at this. I think that you know, data can be a boon and a bane. It can give us wonderful new personalization services, and it can also make lots of really bad decisions that's going to ruin our lives. Uh, and so we got to find a, it's good kind of engineers and socially conscious people think of ways to make it, you know, be less of a bane and more of a boon. Um, and, but intellectually, I just think it's really fascinating because it really does bring together this notion of dealing with uncertainty, coping with, you know, I mean, that's what AIs always try to do is to talk about knowledge and how do you get knowledge. And most of it is about the representation. Well, I can have a representation of nonsense. It can be a rich language in which all the stuff inside it's nonsense because it's not calibrated to the real world. And, and learning people have said, well, calibration's important. I've got to get it to make good predictions against the world. But then the data structures are often not that interesting. Uh, so we really have to, got to combine. We've got to think about statistical principles that give us knowledge out of really large databases. That's knowledge in the statistical sense. It really means there's real error bars and those are calibrated to the real world and how to do things like that at scale. So I think we're far from doing that. And um, there's going to be you know, decades more of work on this topic. Thank you. Do you have time for some questions?
Yes. I just want to do a quick clarification on that question. The, on the next Netflix test, did, was that on their final data, and then you had the answer set available to, to clear against? Uh, this is on a published, uh, I, I don't remember if this is on the final, final data. The person who actually did the experience is named Lester Mackey. He was on the team that came in second to the Netflix prize. And uh, so he's a real expert on it, and I don't remember exactly. This is the, this is the standard public Netflix data set, and we did held out you know, um, to, to evaluate well, my, this. My question was then, your presentation gave some examples of how to handle big data. That is, look at it, apply some divide and conquer approach in order to make it computationally feasible to come up with a solution. Is there some general principles that you employ when you're looking at big data problems to start to analyze and figure out, well, how can I divide and conquer this particular set, or is it kind of a more complicated, each one so nuanced you have to really look at it? Uh, more of the latter. I don't think, I don't have any general principles other than 400 years of statistical background and 50 years of computer science background that lead you to approach problems in new ways. But um, any given really big problem, if you want to get a lot out of it, you've got to spend a lot of time on it. And so you've got to use these tools to try to, you know, it is, most data sets are heterogeneous. They were sampled in different ways and different times by different people with different goals. And there's missing data, all kinds of issues. And so many of the people who work with real big data, I really don't. I'm an academic who nibbles at it. But people really do. They spend a huge amount of time looking and thinking through their data and looking at different pieces of it and thinking about it and thinking about what models would be appropriate and then testing and validating and all that. It's, it's unglorious work to some degree, but it's what you have to do to really get uh, the kind of results you would hope to. And there are, you know, Google, for all the you know, lovely things you see on the web, most of behind most of the things is a lot of data analysis, big data stuff, like the, all the spam stuff and all the make sure the web pages aren't spammy and and you know, et cetera, et cetera. All, there's lots of database decisions, and they're doing all that kind of careful, you know, looking at all, that's what all the MapReduce jobs are doing is data analysis. And, um, so yeah, it's, there's principles. I mean, we're kind of training another generation of people who can go out, good engineers, um, who have some rough and ready principles in their brain and have some tools, and they go out, though, and they have to solve the problem on its own merits. I'm not the kind of person who believes there's going to be one big box, you throw in data, and out comes glory. Yeah. In the what part? The last part? The last Yeah, so it's called the thinning uh, theorem of Poisson processes. That um, if you take a Poisson process realization and you sam sam sample it randomly, that that object is itself a Poisson process. So there's a beautiful, if you want to learn about the Poisson process, uh, you know, I do like to educate myself and others around me. And there's a beautiful book by Kingman called The Poisson Process, a little thin book. Um, and it's, it's not elementary. You get, by the end of it, you get into some pretty impressive deep theory. And if you kind of like discrete math and, and all, it's really a beautiful thing to read and it gives you a lot of tools. And that theorem is, you know, the superposition theorem, the thinning theorem, and marking theorems are all kind of part of that. I consider that one of the main pieces of vocabulary of a current working probabilist and statistician. Yes? About which one? BLB. BLB, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, in sample sizes are small, I would probably just use the bootstrap. It is kind of vetted and simple. Uh, but I think this actually can be faster than the bootstrap, you know, in terms of computational speed, not even on the distributed architecture, but even on a single machine. The bootstrap, in some sense, is kind of the one end of the spectrum, where it takes the entire, you know, if you think of bootstrap as a special case of this algorithm, where gamma is one, right? Well, it's off on one stream into the algorithm, right? And so it's getting, we're getting more diversity by our subsampling procedure, and diversity can be good, right? Especially if you do the averaging, right? So as a way, if you were to allocate your resources, this algorithm kind of gives you more degrees of freedom to allocate the resources. It's sort of the subsampling. Why is it not working so well? Really, it's because when you take little tiny subsamples, they're diverse. You get a lot of them, but they're all really noisy, all right? So you don't do so well. Then you start to do better, and then when you get to the really big ones, um, now they're not noisy anymore, but they're not diverse. You don't have enough of them. All right, and the bootstrap in that regime is doing fine because it's doing the resampling with replacement. And so our thing is kind of getting the best of both these. And the bootstrap's on one end of that spectrum. Uh, it can't be right to be on the, on the, off on that end. So that's kind of an intuitive argument. Yeah. So 
Um, yeah, I wasn't, this is sort of not so much a theory talk today uh, on lower bounds and all that. Um, for matrix completion, there are lower bounds and they match the upper bounds. Um, and so this was really about the constants in all those bounds. These are all going up at cubic rates, but I don't want a cubic rate that's so bad that when I get to real problem size, I'm, 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 I'm hopeless. So this is, we, we got, we know the characterization of this problem, it's theoretically kind of handled, but I want to bring the constants down to be in the real world. So this is kind of what this talk has been about. Um, you know, BLB uh, is a bootstrap type algorithm, and there's long-standing beautiful theory on that. Uh, and so we're kind of just borrowing that. And those aren't bounds. Those are, that, those are based on Edgeworth expansions. So they're good asymptotic approximations to things. And they tell you about the convergence rate, 1 over n. That's beautiful. You know, it's a fantastic convergence rate. Uh, again, I'm now asking the computational question about how can I, can I do those, get those error bars in, in realistic time. Yeah. Yeah, those experiments were all in single course. We're actually kind of hurting ourselves. We're not getting any of the advantages of the distributed implementation that we can do. Uh, so in a distributed implementation, we're going to way beat the bootstrap in that, in that sense. I mean, you can't run the bootstrap on a terabyte of data. You can't do it. We can do it. And we're on some more modest problems. If we do it in a distributed way, we're going to be, we're going to really do well. So I maybe take that back. Even on smaller data, I might just, if I had this as a black box and we're trying to kind of provide that now, um, I might use it essentially on any problem. Um, you know, so by the way, I should mention as a caveat, the bootstrap does not work on all problems. There's theory. That's kind of why some of the theory was developed here. It shows it fails on certain class problems. In particular, if you're trying to estimate the, you have a distribution that has a finite range, a finite support, and you want to use the max of the, of the observed data to estimate the upper end of that, bootstrap will not give you correct error bars for the max. It'll work for quantiles and all kinds of other things that are like the max, but it won't work for the max. So, and so our, our procedure won't work for that either. Uh, right. Um, uh, the, the, if you look at the rates, they have M and N appearing in there. And if they're equal, you know, it becomes symmetric. If they're not, you know, it, um, you, know you, you can look at the, the, the form of the rates. In our algorithm, I told you about columns because I'm thinking about matrices are like this, right? But if the matrix is like this, I'm going to divide it up the other way. So our algorithm, or you could do both. Um, Right, so the, all the math kind of goes, you know, is agnostic to that, really. But the algorithm, you should, you should prefer the one which gives you the simple components in the divide and conquer. Yeah. So in, the, in, the last, in the last part of your talk, you didn't appeal to biology to justify the Poisson. You, you didn't mention any, any no. biology. Yeah. Now, I suspect you would be less pleased with the model if the stationary distribution didn't match up so, so, you know, it's, there are so many possible simplifications. Of the yeah. Now, obviously, you've got great computational advantages, and your performance wasn't to the back and forth. Yeah. And that's a, a, a great positive thing. But as a biologist, as a scientist, somebody who, you know, who cares about the science aspect of things, how do you, what, what do you tell them? Well, you know, this is a cooperative endeavor over many, many years. This is not the end of the story. What we're trying to do now is provide just much better phylogenetic inference. So the phylogenetic inference has done so far is the one I mentioned. You assume the alignment's already given by some other ad hoc procedure. You throw it into this algorithm and you get out some answers. And then the biologists look at these trees and they try to do biological inference. You know, we want to make that chain a better inferential thing. And so we are contributing to that. But now you also want to make it more biologically realistic too. Eventually, we want the whole thing to really be the, the biological model and then invert that for the presence of inference. And so, What's good and bad about this? One, from a biological point of view. Uh, well, the insertion rate being independent of the string length, I think that's kind of bad for lots of processes. If the length gets really, really long, I should have to see more insertions. If the insertion's endogenous to the, to the DNA, all right? Um, uh, what's happening, why this is so good, actually, is because the TKF model doesn't allow some strings to get really long and others to be short. It tends to kind of favor things that are roughly similar lengths. That's kind of what's happening. Now, on the other hand, there's things like retroviruses where things come the outside. And so the insertion rate is dependent on the outside thing. It's not has anything to do with the string length. And there, our model will actually be a better biological model. All right, so you start to think about those issues as you make modeling efforts, and you realize, aha, that's, here's some biology, here's some not biology, and uh, not one model is going to be optimum for all situations, but 
you think a little bit, you work in tandem with biologists to do these kind of things in the long run. But biologists love these tools. They love to download a piece of software which will do phylogenetic inference and then they run after that. And so we've got to also provide tools. We can't just sit with them over the shoulder on every single problem. Thank you.